We're continuing our study in the book of Ephesians. It is the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians or the church at Ephesus. Salvation, individual and corporate, and we have subtitled it, The unity that believers have in Christ brings unity in the church, which is the body of Christ. This is sermon number 118, and I've entitled it, Imitators of God in Christ Jesus. Our text is Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Let us look to the Lord our God in prayer. Our Holy Father, we thank you that you have given us your word, your truth. We pray, O God, that we would understand its meaning. We would understand how in wisdom to apply thy word to our life, to our homes, and to our churches. Help us, O God, to walk in thy truth, direct our path, give us that illumination of thy spirit that we might clearly know how that we can honor thee in everything that we seek to do, in applying these principles of Christianity in every area of our life. Father, we ask now that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive, that which thy word and spirit would teach us, in Christ's name, amen. This Lord's Day, we are moving on to chapter 5 where the apostle is still laying down the principles of practical or applied theology in the life of those for whom Christ has died, to redeem them from the condemnation of God's justice and deliver them to freedom, freedom to pursue righteousness in the power of the Holy Spirit in their daily walk with Christ. Now, just by way of understanding the breakdown of this chapter, if I could, first, in verses 1 and 2, we are told that Christians should imitate their Heavenly Father. They are to walk, he says, in love, after the very example given to us by Christ. Second, we find in verses 3 through 7 that believers should avoid all uncleanliness, impurity, covetousness and foolish jesting, idolatry, because these things are simply excluded from the kingdom of God. and They are simply not to be named, he says, among us. Third, we are told in verses 8 through 13 that while we were once in darkness, but now having the light of the Lord, we are exhorted to walk in that light and bring forth the fruits of of the Spirit that is in our life. That we are to have no fellowship with workers of iniquity whose evil deeds are manifested by the light of Christ, a light that shines in darkness and exposes those wicked, evil deeds. Fourth, in verses 14 through 17, we are exhorted to awaken to awaken ourselves that we might walk circumspectly to redeem the time, to learn what is the will of God for our lives, both personally and its impact upon the ecclesiastical body of Christ, the church itself. Fifth, we have verse 18, which is almost a standalone verse, as it were, where the apostle gives particular directions relative to avoiding excess of wine in the life of a believer. Sixth, we are exhorted in verses 19 through 20 to sing and give thanks unto the Lord. Seventh, we find this exhortation in verse 21 to be submissive to each other in the Lord. 
Submission to one another is essential and foundational to build every other relationship within the church and in your life particularly. Because he gives us in Ephesians chapter 5, in our eighth point of its division, this exhortation as to the duties of husbands and how that they should love their wives as Christ himself has loved his church and what the duties of the wives are to their husbands. For by the marriage union, the union that is set forth illustrates the union between Christ and his church. Thus, we're going to continue with this theme that we have been seeing in chapter 4 as we begin here in chapter 5. If you will, let us turn our attention then to verses 1 and 2 of the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Here Paul says, again, let me read it to you, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. If you would look at the first clause in verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. If I could, let me break that first down to this. Therefore be imitators of God. This therefore be that he speaks of. The word therefore is from the Greek term un, connecting Thus, the previous chapter, indicating to us what has said before. Now, Paul is urging us to continue in that same vein, that same principle. He's urging all the believers here at Ephesus towards manifesting their kindness, their tenderheartedness, their forgiveness toward one another. That they should have a spirit of forgiveness. And therefore, that's why they are entreated to imitate God in this very manner. A God who has always been kind. God who is ready to forgive us. Who in Christ forgave us when we were yet in sin and transgression. Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 through 45, here we read, But I say to you, Christ speaking, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the fruit and on the unjust. Well, our Lord's instruction here cannot be any simpler. The Christian Those who are the sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd. They're commanded to love their enemies. How do you do that? How can one love their enemies? How can one in the same vein turn around and love his wife? Or in the same vein turn around and say that we love one another? It's because the concept of love here is not the idea of an emotional attachment though there is an attachment clearly that is given to us. But the love is that same love that Paul speaks of in Romans when he said love fulfills the law of God. Love is not transgressing your enemy. You know you have an enemy, you don't violate him. Maybe your enemy, 
But as long as he has not done anything to threaten your life, you should not steal from him. You should not slander him. You are to act toward him the way that God acted toward you before your salvation. Because he gives you the very principle of God's common goodness. Thus he can say, bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. For the gospel's sake. Because of your testimony. You, individually. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the son of your father in heaven. That you may be imitators of Christ. It's a very hard path to walk as a Christian. But he says the purpose is because God makes the sun to rise on both evil and good and on the rain as it falls on the just and the unjust. The apostle thus was bringing forth this concept as his point is in the last chapter. That kindness, tenderheartedness, forgiving of one another, just as God in Christ forgives you, is the principle by why how we ought to act, especially in the body of Christ. Listen, if you will, again to the text in Ephesians 4, in particular verse 32, and be kind to one another. Remember the context here. I'm not going to try to extend the context of the world, but yet there are implications that are clearly taught in the Scripture. But look at the context. Be kind to one another in the church of Jesus Christ. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another when someone transgresses God's law. We have to learn to forgive them when they repent of it. We cannot hold it against them. Oh, unequivocally, that the flesh will desire to do that very thing. But as we live with one another, we are to forgive one another. The same principle applies in the marital relationship. But how often have you witnessed or seen marriages where this principle is just clearly, completely, as it were, out of the life of those who profess Christ. And when they get into conflict, they open up the doors of all those things that they have hidden over time and they throw out all of those allegations and accusations. I mean, it begins with you as the imperfect person that you are and it ends up being something about your family. And when they've unloaded their closet, then the other person responds. They didn't hear a thing. They just got their door open and said, I'm ready to heave as soon as everything stops flying this direction. Well, we've seen it there. But it spills over into the church. I mean, if you can't control your life at home in that way, then how can you... It doesn't mean that we're not going to have anger. Yes, we are. There's a righteous anger, but there's an unrighteous anger. We've talked about that inappropriate anger and that we always have to seek forgiveness we always have to try to make amends in our life for be kind to one another be tender hearted be forgiving of one another even as God in Christ forgave you we were not kind to our God before salvation we were not tender hearted to his commands we were not forgiving of one another. But now that we have been redeemed through Christ, brought back into our right relationship with God, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, our hearts must have changed. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. But you're going to be aware of your imperfections. You're going to be aware of what the goal, the bar God has set for us when he said, be ye holy as I myself am holy. Therefore, we should be ready to forgive others. 
This is simply based on the principle that as Christ has borne our faults, it himself upon the cross, we should bear those of our fellow believers. Should we not? We must not forget that God is always ready to hear our cry when we ask for mercy. Thus, we should be ready to hear the cries of our brethren when they desire to be forgiven by us also. In 1 John 4.11, John writes, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. To be in that state of forgiveness, willingness to nurture to keep the law of God toward that individual, to not take opportunity to impugn them and destroy them, to crush them and gain that personal fleshly satisfaction that you have gotten the upper hand. As God is never tired of doing good toward us, We should never then be exhausted in helping those who seek to benefit as a result of our willingness to forgive them. The idea is just that not believers, as we are believers, just to be friends of God, or simply numbered as among His followers, but rather we as believers are to imitate Christ in the particular thing under consideration, which is forgiving one another. Being imitators of God, that we might act in the way that God has acted to us in Christ. The term to imitate comes from the Greek term me metes, meaning one who does what others do. Paul states this principle also in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Imitate me, just as I so also imitate Christ. The text could easily be read this way. You, as we're looking at Ephesians 1 here, or chapter 5, verse 1, you, therefore, Act in the way that God has acted toward you in Christ. In what way has God acted toward those who have been forgiven in Christ? He has acted like a father toward them. And he continues in that. In adopting them through Christ into his family. Sons of the living God. Sons who are to be imitators of their Father, the most natural thing in life that ought to be is a son imitating his father. But when we have transgressions, we're told in Malachi, the great transgressions of our sins will work just the opposite, where sons will reject and hate their fathers, and their fathers will turn against their sons. But that's not the case in redemption. And it ought not to be the case stated among Christians, among believers. We need to act like a father does toward his son. We need to act as the father in heaven does with his sons here on earth in our dealing one with another. We're to be the imitator of God in those matters. Thus he says then, as dear children, meaning as those children which are beloved by their father, who follow the example of him, so also who are the beloved of God, they follow God's structure of forgiveness. Think about this command, if you will. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. 
How much strife, how much contention would be avoided among the saints of God, among the church, the very body of Christ, if we were to follow this very directive. If every Christian who is hungry, or excuse me, angry, who is unforgiving, who is unkind, would just ask himself the simple question, how does God treat me? He would save all the trouble and the heartaches that has and continues to exist in the church of Jesus Christ. We just simply seem to not be able to shake away our past life that constantly keeps trying to trip us up, captivate us, once again, bring us into bondage, as it were. And instead of becoming constructive, we become destructive. We become self-centered. Our desire is ourself first. Just the opposite of what is commanded in the Scripture, where our desire ought to be the nurturing and the building up of others in Christ. The assumption of Scripture is, of course, you love yourself and you love your life. But the command is not to love yourself first, but to love others. And when you learn to love others, you will learn to love yourself because the same principles apply even in your own life. Listen to what Paul writes in Colossians 3, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has any complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. The same principle that he's talking about here in Ephesians. We've been hearing this throughout chapter 4. Now he begins in chapter 5 saying, Having considered what we have said thus far, consider the application of this into your life. Again, you're the renewed man. You're the new man. You don't think like you used to think. You don't act in the way that you used to act before you came into a relationship with Christ. You've put away the pagan things of the world in your life, and you have put on Christ, and those things that bear out the righteousness of Christ in you as a believer Why? Why? He tells us because we've been adopted into the family of God by His grace. Unmerited favor. We didn't do anything. He took the action first. That's what He's saying to you and I. Take the action first. Do not sit and wait. If you know that you have a transgression, if you know that you have a problem with a brother, go to the brother and clear it up. Act in the grace that God has given to you and the very grace in which God has given you. Not waiting for you. We're not Arminians. We're not semi-Pelagians. He acted in his grace to redeem us who were his enemies. So we should imitate God. Being therefore predestined unto the adoption of children, which is, of course, the eternal purpose of God before the foundation of the world, here we have this appeal for us to remember that we have been brought in that very concept of relationship. We have been declared, we have seen it made evident in our life through regeneration of the Spirit. That faith in Christ Jesus has counted us among the children of God. We are the beloved children, being loved with an everlasting and an unchangeable love. 
which is the source of the Spirit's work and the Father's legal adoption of us as children. This is what God has done for us. He's given His Son to purchase our salvation, to forgive us of our sins, to count us among His children. We have been chosen, called, quickened by God's grace, making us the trophies of His treasure in redemption. This salvation expresses the very pity and compassion of God who had for us while we were yet His enemies. Therefore, it's only reasonable as Paul is expressing this here, that we are to imitate God. Such reasonable service is required to imitate God in our personal walk, but also in our relationship with one another. Our duty is to express this same quality of godliness toward one another within the very body of Christ. Unity trumps diversity. Diversity should never destroy the unity of the church. It should never be used as a measuring line by which we say this bar is the bar by which I will or will not fellowship with you. It simply cannot be. The bar is Christ. If you are in Christ, you have no choice. Unity trumps the diversity. The unity must be always built up. It's our work. It's our calling. If you can't do it here, my friends, you're never going to do it out there. Forget it. If you can't do it here, you won't do it in your family. There's only one thing that will help to unite you, and yet in the end it will divide you. Evil. It's amazing how when you do something that is evil... To someone else, others gather around and compliment you on your willingness to take an action. But in the end, believe me, evil trips up evil and it goes to war with each other. There never is real unity in evil. And where there is allowance for diversity, it cannot undo the unity of the essentials of the church of Jesus Christ. We must always give charity where there is diversity. But never forget that unity that we have is based on that very relationship that we have with Christ. Man, it all has to come back to Christ. It can't be about the diversity. It can't be about a particular diversity. Let it never be said we build a church around a particular thing if it is not Christ. Because if Christ is secondary to anything, you're not practicing the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It's impossible. Now Paul takes us on to verse 2. He says, And walk in love as Christ also loved us, and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for the sweet-smelling aroma. Note he begins with, and walk in love. As believers, he's saying to us, we are to walk in the love of God towards God and our brothers and our sisters in Christ. As saints, we are obliged to such actions by the very teaching of God's grace and his law. It requires that of us by the goodness of God and His grace. We are enabled to keep the law of God toward one another. And does not the law of God, if we are keeping that law toward others, does it not <clears throat> benefit them in goodness? Why is the church in the 20th and the 21st century destroying itself? It's become antinomian. We are not bound to law. But the law is the standard for what is good and righteous 
And if you don't know what goodness and righteousness is, if there's no standard in your own life, then there's no standard by which others can judge your actions. How do you know when you're doing good? When in reality, when there's no standard, you might be doing evil. Yeah, you might even be permitted to do evil. And is not through that concept of that anti-law mentality the ability to have a license to sin against God and your fellow man? It most certainly is. Such love demonstrates our desire not to offend God, but rather in conformity to the very will of God, in making God's glory the chief end of our action that belongs to Him and Him alone, especially in our love. Unless we forget, we should walk in that love to Christ Jesus our Lord also. We are to love Him fervently, constantly, in sincerity, with all our heart, above all things. We do so because we are conscious of our relationship, which we stand in relationship to Christ, one to each other. Thus, we will keep his command. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Delighting in his indwelling presence by the power of the Spirit. Therein we should walk in love towards one another, which is the very chief design that Paul is giving in this admonition in our text. But it's not just there. We find it in other texts as well. 1 John 3, 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. First John 4, 20 through 21. John again says, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love God his brother also. The Christian life, the calling of an individual to Christ is to imitate God through the very principles and commandments that Christ has given to us. If you love me, keep my commandments. He gave two general principles. Wow, they both cover the two tablets of the law of God in the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have that theological relationship that we develop in that first commandment of our duty in love and adoration of God to his glory and his honor in by, by keeping the very things God has commanded of us to keep his law, not for redemption, but because of the grace of God in Christ through the regenerating work of the Spirit, we have been empowered to do so. And in that way, now we are also able to turn to our brother in our social relationship one with another and act in the very same way toward him, honoring him who is made in the image of God. Especially those who name the name of Christ. How can we not? How can you say, I love my brother in Christ? When you hate him, you can't do two things at the same time. You either love him or you don't, and your actions are the witness, the demonstration of it. It is the progression of sanctification in your life, both in your relationship to God and in your relationship to your brother in Christ. As that progresses, what we find ourselves doing is seeking to avoid transgression of the law of God by the power of the grace of God in Christ to us in order that we might be able to do the righteousness of God the way that he has commanded of us. You say you love God, but you hate your brother. 
How can that be? How can you hate him whom you've seen and say that you love God whom you have not seen? Can there be love and cursing at the same time coming from the mouth of he who professes to be imitators of God through Jesus Christ our Lord? We who are the sons of the living God. Thus he says to walk in love is not merely to talk about it. It's not to simply exercise that love in a non-passive way, but rather actively exercise it in a way that demonstrates an imitator, one who is like God, who takes the initiative in these things. We are not, and Christianity is not, a spectator sport. We're called to be active. We're called to live our faith. We're called to apply the principles of our faith in our life daily. Hence, we are to advance, to increase, and to abound in God's love and in the love of Christ and continue persevering thereunto. In 1 Peter 4, 8, Peter writes, And above all these things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins, a multitude of transgressions. Love will do that. Now he continues, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. This love is exceedingly great. It is a great, strong love. It is a wonderful love that has been given by grace. It's inconceivable. It's unparalleled as compared to anything that we can experience in this life. Thus we are to love like that love that is given by God in Christ to us. It is not the same love that Christ gives or the Father gives through His Son. It cannot be. We cannot love in that perfection. But it's likened to it. His love and forgiveness. We are to imitate to bring unity to the body of Christ. We are to give ourselves to one another in that kind of sacrificial way. Listen to what Peter says in chapter 2, beginning at verse 21. For to this you were called. This is why you have been called unto God through Jesus Christ. Because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Unquote. This love that we have, this love is not a love for the world. It's not for the things of the world. But it's the kind of love that he's saying should be expressed as it was to us, to others who also are called in Christ, to that body of Christ, the church. Christ willingly gave of his time, gave of his service, gave of his strength. He gave of his name, of his fame. He gave in his reputation. He gave all. He gave away all the comforts of life. And he eventually gave away life itself. He gave himself wholly for the chosen ones, the elect of God, the church, the sheep, his people. While they were Yet, sinners. Thus Paul concludes by saying, as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Christ was both the priest and the sacrifice. He offered himself up a petitionary sacrifice 
for the sins of his people. To expiate them and make reconciliation and satisfaction for them before a sovereign and just God whom they had offended in their rebellion, in unrighteousness, in transgression. Therefore, Christ Jesus was offered up to God against whom we ourselves have sinned and whose justice must be satisfied because of our transgression. This work of redemption and forgiveness was pleasing to God. Such a work as it were, therefore, he says, is as a sweet savor of rest and redemption in that which is sacrificed. He who was the sacrifice of God, unblemished, who voluntarily gave up of himself all that was required on behalf of his elect. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 through 16, For we are God, we are to God the fragrance of Christ. Does God smell of us the fragrance of Christ in the way that we live and act personally in our families within our church? For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Are we that sweet-smelling aroma? Imitating Christ, Imitating Christ in the way that he loved the church, his bride, and gave himself for her. That sacrificial love. That's what Paul wants us to walk in. He wants us to imitate God in Christ. As we have now become children of God through Christ, so we ought to extend that same love and grace and mercy being tender-hearted one with another, being kind and forgiving to one another. Because we have been forgiven in that very same manner, and it's God who took the initiative. Therefore, it behooves us that we too take the initiative where it needs to be taken. Not wait, but take the initiative in the way that we live our life. Matthew Henry wrote this, and I quote, The character that we bear of God's children obliges us to resemble him, especially in his love and goodness and his mercy and readiness to forgive. And those are, excuse me, and those only are God's dear children who imitate him in these things. May God teach us to flee from the way of the past, from those pagan practices that alienated us from being sons of God and identified with God, which really identified us as the enemies of God, those who would not conform in obedience. May we put those things behind us. May we put on those acts of kindness, forgiveness, love, tenderheartedness in Christ as they have flowed to us and as they continue to flow in us through his spirit who indwells. May we so have that desire of love, grace, and mercy to one another. Because if we do not, we cannot say that we are the church of Jesus Christ. When we bring schism and diversity to the church, we are not just attacking one another. We are attacking Christ. So as you have done it unto the least of ye, so he have done it unto me. Got to be careful how you deal with the church or Jesus Christ. Got to be careful on how you deal with one another. Because it's just not offending your brother You can't do it without offending your father. And that is such 
a repulsion in the face of Christ. May it never be said of us. May we always have a heart to become imitators of God and all that he has commanded of us to do as his sons. May we imitate being sons of the living God. Shall we pray?